Okay, class, welcome back. <clears throat> Uh, so this will be the first of many uh, lectures where I'm, I'm really kind of walking through the text itself of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I'll provide context as we go along. It's kind of half a reading and half of a lecture with the idea in mind that, that context and um, Shakespearean uh, um, uh, historical cultural context is not... Uh, uh, really close to us right now, and that the language might be a little bit difficult for people starting out as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's partly for just trying to understand the text uh, as it is. I'm not going to um, uh, give grand interpretations um, so much as I'm going to um, give context as we go along. You can follow along with any uh, edition that you have but the edition that like i said in my earlier lecture that i'm using is the art in shakespeare uh as well and um i've just uh, um while i'm at the outside of these I'll, I'll try and remind you um multiple times i make these lectures like to be more personable for online classes like i'm teaching but uh um i, I have notes that i share with my students and I kind of make them with the idea that these they're, these could be used as podcasts and maybe with the idea that I will eventually submit them as podcasts. Uh, so uh, um, feel free not to look at me, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Feel free to just uh, plug in headphones um, and uh, go for a bike ride, do exercises or something like that. Um, uh, I know that we've all been in um, a pandemic lockdown, many of us, and um, that's changed the ways that I teach for sure. And um, so I'm trying to, to find ways for you to be flexible about um, getting information. And there aren't a lot of PowerPoints or images that I'll share um, in these lectures. Every now and then I have them, I'll let you know when that happens, but otherwise it's kind of me talking with my books and maybe it's easier if you see a human face and um, uh, my my gestures and stuff as I make, uh, uh, but feel free um, <laughs> just to use the audio. Okay, um, so act one of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, I gave you a general lecture. You can refer back to that for the general openings, but let's just dive in here. I'm just finding the beginning of the actual play itself. Um, so we begin with Theseus and, and Hippolyta and, um, and Philostrate. He's kind of a minor player here. And uh, we're in court. And... Uh, Theseus basically wants to get it on with Hippolyta, right? And he says, I can't, uh, uh, now fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon. But oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. And so there's a lot of moon imagery. I'll kind of point it out as we go through the text. Um, I'm not going to give a grand interpretation, like I said of it. Um, and that might be something that's uh, uh, useful to sort of draw out in a paper. Um, for students in the class, you will have various paper assignments to do. Um, and one good thing to do um, when we're thinking about studying Shakespeare is to notice the imagery and track it throughout the play. And so the moon imagery in Midsummer Night's Dream might be um, a useful um, way to track the play. Um, uh, the moon, which is figured as a she here, um, sometimes called Cynthia, um, uh, she lingers my desires um, like a step dame or a dowager long withering out of a young man's revenue. Um, and Stephen Greenblatt, the great uh, uh, Shakespeare historian um, and scholar, has has some things to say about how that might um, that passage might relate to the young Shakespeare's life. He gets married rather young to an older woman who is uh, um, a devout Protestant, um, and we get the Forest of Arden, which is a part of the um, a part of where. Um, her she, she was from a and Shakespeare's a from a 
background of um, nobility, um, although not directly. So she has a lot more money than than Shakespeare, who's about eighteen, when um, when she gets basically, I th we think she gets pregnant, um, and they they get married, and so um, which is uh, she's she's quite a bit older than him, and um, and then there's dealings with families and and marriages and and laws, so. Um, uh, uh, it could also be a relation to um, somebody who um, is a potential uh, um, source of money for Shakespeare, a patron of his art as well. Um, and some speculation has happened um, uh, over um, uh, whether the, the play is being written for a marriage and um, and for his particular marriage. I'm not going to go deep into that right now, but that's just already like the first lines into the play. There's so much work that's been done on Shakespeare over the years that like that there's there's um, tons of context. And so Theseus is the mythical founder of Athens, we know. Hippolyta is an Amazonian queen. We know that in the real myths, Theseus does not marry her. He rapes her. And they have a child, Hippolytus, who's the subject of Euripides' uh, um, tragedy. Um, here, um, he has conquered her, um, and uh, they are getting married. So Hippolytus says, Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And that four nights is going to suggest that like the dream that we have throughout the play is going to sort of be taking up and occupying that whole period of multiple days and nights. Um, and then the moon, again, like to a sliver um, uh, uh, bow, not um, now bent bent in heaven shall behold the night of our solemnities so she seems okay with the union at that point right um, unlike the myth theseus says go philistrate stir up the athenian youth to merriments awake the part of the nimble spirit of mirth turn melancholy forth to funerals the pale uh companion is not for our pomp um and so get ready Things, there's going to be a marriage. Um, I mentioned the term carnivalesque, which has been the subject of Mikhail Bakhtin's um, uh, literary criticism um, of the time. Um, and, and just what we think about carnival, um, uh, such as uh, Mardi Gras in the United States and in New Orleans, that these public festivals are for, um, as I said in my previous lecture, um, uh, they are political in the sense that they are about sort of procuring the next generation um, of this of civic bodies. So we loosen morals, um, uh, we hook up with people, people get married, they have kids, and that continues on the civic body. Um, Hippolyta um, says, Theseus, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love with the in, doing the in, injuries but i will wed thee in another key with pomp with triumph and with reveling so yeah we were at war that's all done now and um uh, we're going to shift the register as he says um which is a kind of reference to music there right uh and then we get Aegeus, um, who's uh, one of many father figures, and is, a, you know, in some ways we can think of Aegeus as a father to Theseus as well. Um, uh, but that's not being drawn upon so much in the text. Um, uh, so Aegeus is here directly the father of Hermia, um, and uh, this conflict or enters enters the scene, right? Um, so uh, before I get to the conflict, conflict, just a couple of things on the opening passages. So first of all, again, what's going on with the moonlight? Four moons, four days, a moonless night is coming. Uh, um, that's when the new moon is going to happen. So um, uh, uh, the moon wanes, right, when it's, when it's shrinking. Um, and then there's a night where there's no moon. And then there's a new moon where the, there's a... Uh, the crescent moon and it starts to wax again right so we want to notice if you're tracking the moon you want to note 
um, light and dark imagery or night and day in imagery as we proceed throughout the other acts. Um, uh, um, then we, so we like, in, I, I mentioned some stuff about the, the background text with um, Hippolyta here, and then um, the, this drama that shows up. And we want to think about like, what is Hippolyta thinking, you know, as a character who's, she's, she's rather silent through some of this stuff, but we see some gestures from Theseus to Hippolyta. So if you were acting the part of Hippolyta, you might be showing some annoyance with some, some of what's going on here. So Aegeus says, happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. There were no dukes in ancient Athens. So there's this kind of mixture of Shakespearean time. Um, uh, thanks, good Aegeus. Um, uh, uh, what's the news with thee? Uh, um, full of vexation, I come I uh, with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius, uh, my noble lord. This man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. So we see these directions. Uh, um, the play, um, uh, the director's actions are sort of um, embodied in the language of, um, of Aegis here. Um, uh, uh, stand forth Lysander um, and my gracious duke this man has bewitched the bosom of my child um, uh, in, uh, um, if we look at the names of these characters I'll have us look at them a little bit later it's interesting that Lysander is also the name of a Spartan general that had conquered Athens at one point in time. So I think Shakespeare's playing a little bit with the, with even the names of people here. Um, so we get this, the, this, this question that comes up that we want to think about throughout the play as a whole, again, um, something that's possible for, for paper presentations, some um, later on is, 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 and just for focus and tracking the story is does a father get his way? right? Like, what is the relationship? And, and oftentimes, I mean, there are a lot of father and child relationships throughout Shakespeare. We'll see it in Hamlet. Um, there's the succession, the multiple succession of the Henry um, uh, family, the um, uh, of the various Henry kings, um, and uh, the account of the War of the Roses um, kind of going on in, in the history plays. So um, he Shakespeare's concerned, but I think Shakespeare's especially concerned with father-daughter relationships, and he has a daughter um, as well. He does have a, a son to Hamnet who passes away earlier on, um, and so uh, um, uh, I, th I think that if, if we're thinking about um, Shakespeare's life, that maybe there's a particular accent that we want to put on the, the father-daughter relationship. So um, the, if the question is, does a father get it his way? Um, this was also law at the time. So the father's will or the father's death um, is referenced here or a nunnery. Um, so that's at about line 70. If I flip over to that. Um, so again, this is ironic because Christianity doesn't exist in ancient Greece. And so there's this double layering going on, um, in what Shakespeare is saying. Um, before I quite get to 70, there's just a couple of other things I marked in, in the text. Um, uh, uh, he just lays out his, his complaint. Theseus says, what say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid. To you, to you, your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form of wax by him imprinted, and within this power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Um, Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. This reference to wax and the imprinting of wax, like a wax seal being pressed in, that's actually the imagery that was being used for the ways that um, male semen interacted with female parts, that there was an imprint into the woman's womb and that that's where the father's sort of role 
in the creation process of the baby happen. So there's, there is, it might not seem that sexual right now, but that the, um, the language is definitely gesturing to that. Um, by him imprinted and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Um, Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. Uh, and so this is a patriarchal culture, right? This is uh, uh, lineages passed down through fathers, um, through the Euro-Christian imaginary here. Um, and who the father is, uh, they, um, there's all this ideology of the time for, for what the father's role is. Um, no sort of two halves of DNA <laughs> um, happening uh, um, at this point in uh, Euro-Christian history. Um, and he's, so, so Theseus says, Demetrius is a worthy gentle, gentleman. And Hermia's response is, so is Lysander. And this is a theme that you see going on throughout the whole play, but especially, you know, it's being established in Act One that there's a way to think that he, that sorry, Lysander and Demetrius are just interchangeable. And uh, that shows up even in the ways that they're going to compete with each other. Um, uh, Theseus says, in himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice or lacking your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. So when there is the possibility of interchangeable parts, it is the father's law that's supposed to carry things. Um, it's a little bit hyperbolic, though. It's a little bit exaggerated. So you might be like, oh, from a 21st century feminist perspective, like, look at how patriarchal this was and um uh how confined hermia is and yes that, i think that is that's tr that's that's right um generally for speaking about the cultural context but it's clear that hermia has some recourse to her own decisions here as well so uh um yeah it's not like a a post spice girls type of girl power kind of <laughs> feminism but she does have some personality, as we'll see. Um, and and she, she makes some, some statements about herself. Hermia says, um, uh, I would look my father, I, I would my father looked, but with my eyes. I want my father to see things from my point of view. Um, Theseus says, rather your eyes must with his judgment look. And so this back and forth, this tit for tat, that I had mentioned in my, my previous lecture is going on where the, uh, the subject of eyes, um, uh, um, uh, not, not the subject of the sentence, but um, uh, the reference to eyes um, gets pulled over into the next line. Um, Hermia says, I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I'm made bold. Um, and so she's referencing her femininity there. And she's also talking to the Duke Theseus here, right? Um, Nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts, but I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse um, to wed Demetrius. So she knows she's confined by her womanhood and by her gender. And gender is definitely one of the ways that we want to think about our inquiry into these texts. But she's also has enough agency to say, well, can you tell me what's going to happen either way? Right? That's not the same thing as saying, F you, not, this doesn't matter. I don't need to be confined by it. But she is saying, what are my options? What's the worst that can happen if I refuse Demetrius? Theseus says, um, either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. Right? So again, Christianity did not exist in ancient Greece, um, but this is her choice being offered. So it's actually not Greek culture that's trying to be represented here. It's the context of Shakespeare's time, right? And the law. And there's a bit of ridiculousness there, I think, that, that's being poked at. Um, so Theseus goes on. 
uh, for I to be in shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold fruitless moon. Thrice blessed they that mastered so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage, but earthlier happy is the rose distilled that that than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows lives and dies in single blessedness now i want to point that out that imagery of the distilled rose and the flowers um yeah you could become a nun but you're going to be happier in earth if you're able um uh to not die a virgin basically <laughs> not withering on the thorn grows lives and dies in a, in single blessedness so um uh, um, that kind of imagery is showing up in the first, um, even in the first 10 of Shakespeare's sonnets. And so um, just in terms of period wise and writing, we see a very much of the same stylistic technique that's happening at that point in Shakespeare's life. And look at what Hermia does with the language here. So she takes the image, she takes the metaphor of the rose on the vine here from Theseus. So there's that transfer of the idea of the, it was the eyes earlier, and now we get a more sophisticated, a more developed idea. So I will grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. So, wow, the imagery here already is just like, like, so the imagery is cultivation and growth and plants. Um, uh, and there's some play going on with singlehood <laughs> as well here. Um, so will I grow, so live, so die, my Lord, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. So there is some pushback here on Aegeus, right? There is um, uh, all of the language of yield and my virgin patent, this kind of language of law, the yoke um, and sovereignty, almost relating her femininity and her womanhood to land and a land that's being controlled by a father by a patriarch right and so she does display the gendered context the imagery of the time where women are associated with land in the euro christian imaginary um and uh they are to be fertilized um by the seed of the male um in terms of 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 the waxen image um, stuff um, and that the law and patents sort of come in here as well uh, uh, and that legal language I think is really important it's especially important for some of Shakespeare's audience members um, Theseus says take time to pause and by the next new moon the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship upon that day either prepare to die for obedience to your father's will or else to wed demetrius as he would or on diana's altar pro to protest for i austerity and single life uh okay so what does he mean, mean by diana's altar here well this is artemis so if you remember back to my earlier lecture on the general context um artemis slash diana Diana is the Roman name um, for the Greek goddess of the hunt. Um, and she's a goddess of chastity. Uh, remember that, that in the Greek myth, Hippolytus, the son of Hippolytus and Theseus, because um, uh, Hippolyta was raped um, uh, and they don't get married, because she was raped, um, Hippolytus in the myth um refuses sex and then that turns into the own euripides tragedy um it, its own tragedy um from euripides which i covered a little bit in my earlier lecture um uh and so again we want to think like <laughs> who else is in the room here right hippolyta hippolyta is in the room watching all of this stuff go down um 
And so if you're interested in gender or a women's perspective here, like there's a lot going on. Shakespeare gives us a, a lot to think about in terms of, of female gender. Um, even though at the time, of course, the actors on the stage would all be men playing these parts, right? Um, Demetrius says, relent sweet Hermia and Lysander yield thy crazed title to my certain right. And so we see this language of right showing up, patents, rights, sovereignty. You have her father's love, Demetrius, let me have Hermia's. Do you, do you marry him? So Lysander um, uh, turns it back on Demetrius. Scornful Lysander, says Aegeus, true, he hath my love, and what is mine, my love shall render him. What is mine is Hermia, his daughter, right? And so all of this language of possession and rights is operating thematically to hold the text together. And this is part of the brilliance of Shakespeare. <clears throat> Um, and that's part of why it might be a little bit confusing as well. I understand if it's the first Shakespeare that you've read. Um, uh, but that's part of, of, of the beauty is the, and, and, and part of the, the wit, I think, is the way that the imagery controls and the way people shift their perspective back and forth on the imagery itself. Remember from my earlier lecture, he's aspiring to classical authors like Ovid who are more concerned not with the plot and what happens in a particular story, but in the way that a theme might be being dealt with. And one of the themes here is love throughout the play, right? I said that he might be giving a satire on courtly love, which is a Christian kind of love. And uh, this um, part of the satire here is working with, with legal language around um, people's bodies and and their sexuality and of course we're in a court type of setting and we're still in the city of Athens we have not gone to the the forest yet um uh, so let me read Aegis's lines here again scornful Lysander true he hath my love and what is mine my love shall render him and she is mine and all my right of her, I do estate to Demetrius. So again, that language of inheritance as well. Um, uh, Lysander says, I am my Lord as well derived as he. I'm just as good as him. So that interchangeability um, as well as possessed my love. And, and then that's, that, that's coded language. I am my Lord as well derived as he, as well, as well possessed. And this could refer to how much money they have. Um, it's also a double entendre or a double meaning. These referencing um, his male sexuality, male parts. Uh, my love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius's. And which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved by of the beauteous Her, um, uh, Hermia. Uh, why should not I then prosecute my right? Okay, so again, this is that language of the legal language, prosecute my right. Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nader's daughter, um, Helena, and won her soul, and she sweet lady dotes devoutly dotes dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man um so uh um we get um this this kind of accusation of inconstancy going on um theseus says i must confess that i've heard so much and and with demetrius's thought with, sorry, with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full of self affairs, my mind did lose it. So like, yeah, yeah, I'd heard something about that in the past. But Demetrius come and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for both of you. For you, fair Hermia, look you an arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields up yields you up 
which by no means may, may we may extenuate to death or to a vow um, of single life. Come, my Hippolyta, what cheer, my love? And so we remember I've said like, like what's Hippolyta thinking in all of this? It's like, well, Shakespeare gives us that like gesture, like, like per perhaps we've been seeing from the audience perspective, some eye rolling, some other kinds of gestures. And, and Theseus is like, what's wrong? What's wrong, my dear? And he's kind of just been being an ass and talking about um, uh, Athens law. Um, although I shouldn't say he's been being an ass because someone else turns into an ass in the play later on. Um, so they depart and then we get this exchange between Lysander and Hermia and then eventually Helena as well. Um, uh, so just a couple things to reemphasize here. There's this interchangeability of the lovers. The arguments that the suitors make rest on them both being equals. Um, uh, merely being equals, but also on who loves more. Um, uh, we have the waxed impression, the soul and the body being a reference to men's relationship to women. Um, uh, and then we have this kind of nature imagery um, that we might want to track in papers. So we've got the moon that's waxing and waning. We've got a dark night or a new moon coming. Uh, there's a cold and fruitless moon is one of the reference languages, um, a pieces of language that shows up here. The distilled rose um, that re reminds us of the sonnets, which also deal, deal with this kind of growing and yielding and patent and sovereignty imagery. Theseus has said, wait till the next moon. Um, we've got references to Diana or Artemis or Cynthia, the hunt of love, and lunatics. So that term lunatics going crazy at night is a reference to Luna or the lunar situation. Um, and so uh, we know that there's this is setting up that there might be some craziness is going to happen. Um, and uh, the moonless night in the period is a night without Artemis. It's a night... Um, it's the opposite of a full moon. So if a, if you think about werewolves or something howling at the full moon when it's the craziest, there's um, a kind of doubling of the lawlessness. So if the if Athens is kind of law and order and they're going to the forest where there isn't law and order, at the same time, um, Artemis, who would be governing the hunt throughout the forest, um, uh, isn't there. So the chasteness that would be part of Artemis, um, the virginity, um, that's gone. So it opens up things for people hooking up. Uh, note that the agricultural and legal imagery, um, again, um, is evident throughout the sonnets too. We um, also know that many practitioners of law frequent in the plays um, and that Shakespeare was probably looking for some sort of patronage at this point in time. And so there's a, specially, a special amount of attention to showing how great he is with classical stuff. Um, uh, okay, I think I've covered all of this stuff through the notes. Okay, and then we get this interesting um, dialogue between Hermia and Lysander. And um, what's interesting is uh, Hermia references um, kind of ironically um, uh, uh, the character of Dido, who's a character from Virgil's Aeneid, not only from the Aeneid, but it's um, what's being referenced here is Virgil's Aeneid. So I, I said that Shakespeare um, is really a master of, of Latin and, and really loves Roman poets especially. I've talked about Ovid, but I have not talked about um, Virgil yet. Um, and so look at this exchange. This is about 128-ish um, uh, in Act 1. How now, my love, What is? why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? And again, we've seen this kind of withered rose imagery earlier on, right? So it's really beautifully tied in to the earlier stuff. Um, Be like for want of rain, says Hermia, 
which I could could well be team them with the tempest of my tears. I me says Lysander, uh, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth, but either it was different in blood, and then he gets interrupted by Hermia. Oh, cross too high to be enthralled, too to low. Um, or else misgrafted in respect of years. This is just back and forth, line after line here, and where they're kind of agreeing with each other. Um, or spite, too old to be engaged to young, or else it stood to, upon the choice of friends. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes, says Hermia. Um, or if there were a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it. And so they're, notice how they're like referring back to old times, old stories, all of that. That's kind of already setting up the reference that I'm about to point to here. Um, uh, and we also have Pyramus and Thisbe underneath the text, which was the um, text that was being referenced for Romeo and Juliet. And so Hermia and Lysander really sound kind of like these kind of like Romeo and Juliet here, although we're in a comedy. Lysander says, or if there were a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it uh, momentary as a sound, swift as a, sh as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the collied night that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth. And ere a man hath power to say, behold, the jaws of darkness do, do devour it up so quick bright things come to, to confusion being in love sucks <laughs> it sucks throughout the time period so they're kind of lamenting this um, especially being in love when you have to, being made to see through other people's eyes so hermia says here if then true lovers have ever have been ever crossed it stands as an edict in destiny then let us teach our trial patience because it is customary a customary cross as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs wishes and tears poor fancies followers so all of the different uses of the term cross which of course is also signaling christianity as well right but also the star crossed lovers uh, that there is, as I said, in satire, if courtly love is being sat satirized and courtly love is a kind of Christian love that's a transcendent love, and these people want to, like, they love each other in a different way. They want to, like, get it on. They Like, it's not a transcendent love. It's a very earthly, like, like we want to get married and, and we want to have sex. We want to have kids, right? Um, or a family. Um uh um but she says let's wait a minute and then um lysander says a good persuasion therefore hear me hermia i have a widow aunt a dowager of great revenue and she hath no child from athens is her house remotely seven leagues and she respects me as her only son um and so we can go there if you meet me in the forest tomorrow this sets up the plot for later on and then um uh uh, um, so there, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, and that to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then steal forth like thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena, to do observance of the morn of May, there I will stay for thee. This is interesting. Like I met you once with Hannah, so there was a kind of interchangeability. We know that he used to maybe have some feelings for Helena, but he's changed his mind and that this is May Day and that there are maypoles and maypoles are a time of carnivalesque. They're a time where people um, get, get merry. They were actually brought over from England into some places and made illegal in early um, uh, New English law in um, the territories that later became the United States. Um, big arguments about May Day festivals because they were seen as being pagan and the Puritans didn't want them there. So again, it may not seem obvious at the, um, at the surface um, 
Uh, but there's a lot of openness for sexual imagery, dancing, merriment, um, and um, uh, being a little bit loose from the laws of one place. Also, the laws of one place do not necessarily apply to another. Athens laws don't necessarily apply to um, uh, Lysander's aunt's place, which um, I've said Lysander is um, considered a, a, a name that's associated with Sparta, Sparta, which would be outside of Athens. Um, Hermia says, "This is uh, just check out this response. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, and by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, and by that fire which burned the Carthage queen when the false Trojan under sail was seen by all the vows that he ever men have broke in number more than ever women spoke in that place in that same place thou hast appointed me tomorrow truly will I meet thee meet with thee I swear by all of Cupid's bows by everything that love can do and I swear by the people who have been screwed over by love in particular this woman the Carthage queen Dido who um, uh, tries to get Aeneas the um, who's a Trojan who's fleed the Trojan War and he goes to eventually found Rome um, uh, at least in Roman um, and Latin mythology um, uh, it should just be Roman mythology there uh, that uh, and then uh, there are references there as well that are sort of hidden in the text as well that some of those people then came over um, and brought that culture to England as well and that happens in much earlier English books I'm gonna pull out like uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth and the history of the kings of Britain um, and so some of these sources Hollingshead is also around here somewhere, um, which is a source for Shakespeare as well. So he is kind of trying, uh, uh, in the background context, he is kind of telling some things about England um, or assuming some things about England, but it's not overt in the text itself here. Um, but English, um, this is another way that English culture and education um, try to make itself seem sophisticated like, um, like ancient Rome. And so the Latin culture um, is being sort of imported in as a way to say um, that England is now the center of great civilization. Um, okay, and so they make the promise and um, then uh, we get Helena entering in. And then this tit for tat, the exchange um, uh, is so tightly woven here. Um, Hermia says, um, "God speed for Helena, whither away? Call you me, f call you me fair, right? So playing on fair Helena, call you me fair. That fair again unsay. Demetrius loves your fair, oh happy fair. Your eyes are load stars and your tongue sweet air, more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear." When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear. So notice the rhyming that's going on here as well. It's showing up. Um, it, does, it's, it shows up in Hermia as well, um, but not. it's not as consistent. Um, and so these, is, these are lovers couplets that, that are being spoken here. Um, so I've said that this is one of the most rhymed plays of Shakespeare's um, early on in the text, uh, um, in his career anyway. Um, uh, again, around um, 193, 192, oh, teach me how you look and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. And Hermia says, I frown upon him. Yet he loves me still. So it's like just being asked, like, you know, how, 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 why is it that Demetrius loves you? What is it that you do? And she's like, well, I ignore him. 
right? And so this is the kind of comedic moment. Um, th this kind of joking goes on throughout the text. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Like, oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. Right, so this back and forth, um, back and forth type of language that's going on. Um, uh, so um, as we, I'm gonna kind of move on from from uh, um, the the chap from sorry Act One here. Um, lots of things to keep commenting on um, before moving on, and there's no way to exhaust these texts, but uh, um, more early on in the lectures, and I want to give you a sense of some of the richness here. Um, there are some lines that sound like the sonnets, like around 234, love looks not with the eyes but with the mind, and therefore is winged, cupid, painted, blind. Um, nor hath love's mind any judgment taste, wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste, and therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys in game themselves forswear, so the boy love, which is Cupid, right, is perjured everywhere. Um, this is Helena's speech that's going on here. And so Helena is being used to sort of talk about that theme of love itself, which is interesting that she kind of takes it over from that conversation that we were seeing earlier between um, Hermia and Lysander. Then we get um, 1.2, okay? So we've been in court for Act 1, one so far, and um, we had the kings, and then uh, then we had Aegeus, the, the father, and then we had the lovers come in, and then uh, we had, you know, the lovers alone, Lysander and Hermia, and then we had, and then we had Helena, right? Um, and now we switch. And so uh, these, this goes from mirrors that structure of overplot to underplot, but it's also mirroring kind of class structure in the Euro-Christian imaginary, right? Um, so we get uh, here uh, the entrance of Peter Quince, um, uh, snug bottom flute, snout and starveling. Um, and uh, these guys are gonna be putting on a play here but if you look back to the dramatis persona persona at the beginning of the book um, these are artisans right and so nick bottom is a weaver um and peter quince is a carpenter and the bellows maker and tom snout so uh these are all people that that have another kind of trade of an artisan trade but they're also going to be putting on a play as well. So they're not necessarily great at being players, at being actors and stage directors, kind of amateurs at that um, as well. Um, and Peter Quince, sort of, if we think about this thing where like Shakespeare is being made fun of at the time for not being university educated by some of his friends, uh, Peter Quince kind of almost kind of becomes a parody of Shakespeare himself right the amateur director who's trying to put on a show or at least he's seen it as an amateur from the outside um and and uh, uh um so that's kind of going on at the as a background layer to the underplot here um and so they say that uh um, quince says mary our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe and right there we get this like reference it's like Pyramus and Thisbe is like the most lamentable comedy it's like so this kind of mixture of comedy and tragedy going on just like very clear um look at this character of Bottom that shows up which is one of the most hilarious um characters in Shakespeare um uh and, and he will show up like this Bottom type of character th shows up um, uh, as as a knight, a famous knight um, in uh, some of the Henry plays, um, it, uh, as well. Like that. Uh, so, 
uh, he does show up as this kind of ass, but he kind of has like this kind of street wisdom to him. Um, he's not exactly a trickster, but he might f cross over with the trickster character. But this kind of character shows up um, almost like a drunken type of character, com com comedic relief shows up um, in Shakespeare plays. Um, and um, uh, Quince is th th handing out parts for the play, and Nick Bottom asks who he's going to be set for. Um, uh, he said, uh, you, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? So this is like this, this, this hilarious, like in a reference to um, like, like the, um, the uneducated parts of, of, of audience that's come, that comes to playhouses, right? It's like they can reduce everything. It's like, are you like, an, are you like the bad guy or are you the good guy? And the bad guy is a tyrant and the other, the good guy is a lover. Um, uh, Quince says, a lover that kills himself most gallant for, for love. Bottom says, that will, will ask me, sorry, that will ask some tears in the true performing of it all. If I do it, let the audience look to, to their eyes. <coughs> I will move storms. I will condole in some measure to the rest. Yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. So I'm going to be so good. I'm going to rock it. <laughs> you know, like I'm going to make everybody weep. They better watch out for their eyes. Um, I'm going to play it so well, even though I'm like, I'm probably better for being a tyrant. <laughs> um, and so you see this throughout the, this play. Bottom can apparently play any part. Um, I could play Hercules, that's Hercules, right? Uh, rarely, or uh, a part to tear, um, uh, to tear a cat in um, to make all split. And then he got the, he has these lines. So remember I've said that um, uh, um, this is the most rhymed play. We've had rhyming couplets, the lover's couplets showing up. But then we get the, the briefer lines. This would be an example of bad poetry or doggerel. Um, the raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phib um, Phibus car shall shine from afar and make and mar the foolish fates. Um, Phoebus Apollo that's the reference it, it, that is a reference to um, ancient mythology but it's a very surface level kind of reference that's happening here and so Shakespeare has set up a situation where yes in actual England he's being made fun of um, he's writing for the sophisticated crowd at the same time that he's writing for a lower um, class cloud uh, um, crowd a lower class crowd in that kind of euro christian hierarchy the class hierarchy of of high to low um and uh he's able to situate peter quince in the middle where himself where he's got these people even actors like bottom nick bottom who are going to play this stuff where he can make fun of nick bottom um, but he's not derisive of Nick Bottom. And I think that we've, as we watch throughout the play itself, there is a kind of lovable quality. Um, in one of the lectures, prep lectures I watched um, as I was researching for these lectures, you know, um, uh, one of the lectures, and I'm sorry, I'm spacing his name right now. Um, it sort of mentioned that, that, um, uh, that, that the, the relationship between Titania and, and Nick Bottom later on in this play, when they fall like, like are under a charmed spell, is, is one of the most ideal love situations in all of Shakespeare. That's a pretty interesting perspective, I think, I think to think about. So um, yeah, Nick Bottom might be being made fun of, but it, he's not seen as just an idiot. Um, uh, and then they, <laughs> we get uh, Peter Quince, who keeps passing out parts, pass out the part to Flute. Um, he says, Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. And Flute says, what is Thisbe, a wandering knight? <laughs> Nay, Faith, uh, it is the late, sorry, Quince says, it is the lady that Pyramus must love. And Flute's like, Nay, Faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. 
<laughs> that's all one you shall play it in a mask and so he's teaching these guys how to be actors and what the stage is so remember from my opening lecture he is has this context shakespeare has this context on the stage where he, that a character is teaching other characters how to act and how to be on stage and what the stage is about and at the same time he's teaching the audience how to have imagination themselves as well so that kind of doubling that takes um, place throughout Shakespeare's texts um, over and over again um, uh, um, and 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 Quince of course he, he's, he starts worrying you know um, like please remember your parts um, bottom of course is like I could play the lion too I could play all of these things it's a really funny exchange I'm not gonna belabor it I'll let you read it on your own um, here um, but Quint says please like learn your parts and show up here tomorrow so we get another kind of promise for tomorrow that mirrors the promise that Lysander and Hermia have made with each other earlier on in act one so act one and act two and just um as i close here with acts one and two um uh the the separation of acts is not always in um the 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 shakespeare shakespeare's documents that kind of comes in from later editors as well um and then there are a couple of different editions in different folios i'm not i haven't really addressed that issue in this kind of lecture but um uh, the, the different folios might have like s some different lines at times, different words, different spellings and things like that that come in. Um, but at least that kind of parallel that I'm pointing out between the promise seems to be closing um, uh, these two acts. And I'm going to finish. I'm going to end this lecture on um, Act 1 and I'll start another lecture for Act 2 just to give you guys some pause and um, allow you to collect your own thoughts and um, take a break and come back with um, Act 2. Uh, thanks so much for your attention, and see you in a few minutes my time.